we're finally going to get some things cleared up. All right, uh, let's get to the bottom of it. <laughs> you're one of my this heroes. This is the new norm, right? If I could say that in 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 this business, because you you, you seem to have 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 come up from you know the smaller ends of doing film and production to being probably the most prolific producer uh, of, of, of shows that I can think of. <laughs> Your name's on everything. You know, it's funny. There, there was a story where um, I, I met these people from Russia and they said, did you know that you're the biggest producer in Russia? And I said, I am? And they said, yeah, because years ago, the bootleggers took the billing block from Eight-Legged Freaks and they put it on everything. So people in Russia think you did Titanic. They think that you did Jurassic Park. Well, take it. All the I mean, it's, uh, there's no copyright in Russia. Um, there you go. I was actually on the junket for Eight Legged Freaks. Oh my gosh! And I had them put tarantulas all over me uh, for a stand-up I did. So that's that's, that's where it starts, I think. That's dedication, my friend. I'll tell you, and I'm scared of spiders. I scream like a little girl when I see a spider. <laughs> So t talk to me a little bit about your beginnings, because you were, you were born in the Philippines. Uh, what? Well, actually, I was born in the United States, but my mother was born in the Philippines. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, the, see, there, there's those rumors we have to clear up right away. <laughs> uh, your mother was an actress, though. Yes. She was actually on the original Star Trek. She Wolf did a guest the star. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Now you're, you're, you're an inglorious Trek expert. That's awesome. <laughs> She got to meet John Fiedler when, uh, mm -hmm. when he was being John Fiedler. That's um, right. Did you get the acting bug early in life? Um, I had the filmmaking bug early. And there was a certain point in my life where I thought that acting could be my way in. Um, but I don't think I was ever, I mean, I worked as an actor for about 15 years, but I don't think I was ever really an actor. To me, it was always an, an ends to a mean, a means well, to an end. More of an education than going on set and just kind of understanding how everything worked? Well, I think my hope was that if, if, if I could act with the right people, I could develop relationships and, and move to the other side of the camera, which is ultimately what happened. I, I ended up acting in a movie in Germany with an upcoming director, um, and we ended up uh, uh, partnering up and doing a lot of films together, and he ended up becoming a big Hollywood director, and I wrote his coattails to fame and fortune. <laughs> yeah, we won't mention any names. Um, but writing also is a means to an end for you. Uh, uh, sure. And you are a prolific writer. Is that a lonely task? Do you write with other people, though? I tend to prefer to write with other people. Um, everyone has their own thing, but uh, um, I, I have written alone, but I, I prefer it. Like, I love in television when you have the writer's room, when you have other people to bounce your ideas off of. Also, I think when people challenge you in the room and you have to defend your ideas sometimes you'll find out your idea is not such a great idea and other times in the in the effort to defend it you actually define it better and improve it so i i, I love i love writing in collaboration i can't stand writing by myself I, I go back to the old dick van dyke show and say that's how writers are you have to have one on the couch <laughs> one at the desk and one pacing there you go <laughs> somebody um, get and, sandwiches and in developing that i mean did, did being an actor help you write and and, and produce? Without a doubt. I mean, I, I think honestly, you know, I mean, look, I've been a PA, I've worked in the camera department, I, I worked in the loading dock. I mean, I think the more jobs you have in the film industry and the more you can understand what each person on the crew does, the better a producer you can become. I mean, and in, in, in my case, you know, since I had started the, the route through acting, um, the writing allowed me to act every single character. So parts I could never be cast in, I could act you know, behind the uh, word processor. In developing your your series, though, um, are, are you, is your personality part of some of these these characters? Well, I, I, I let me put it a, a different way. I think that there is, there is a very defined sensibility of what I prefer to do as an artist. And that permeates everything I do, whether it's a TV series or a movie or a web series or documentary even. You know, there's three things that I'm interested in. You know, the first is I, I find life to be very difficult. And so I like my art to be fun. Mm. Not that I can't enjoy other art that's not fun and dark and edgy. But for me, the art that I create, I want it to be fun. Yeah. Additionally, I have an addiction to the cheer moment. That moment where you just go, yes! 
I, I'm addicted to it like, like, a, like a heroin addict. I mean, I just got to have it. But the third thing is that I like to be emotionally invested in, in my work. I, I like to have that moment where I get a little bit weepy. And that tends to temper one and two. And that's kind of how that balance works. And you'll see it in anything that has my name on it, um, unless, of course, I got replaced and somebody else took over. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I we won't see... talk about Geostorm. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I do see some themes there. You know, uh, the Robin Hood theme, the Lone Ranger theme. Uh, you, you also have this wonderful knack for putting, uh, you know, misfits together for a, for a cause, too. And it's, it's, it's delightful to see that work out because people do see themselves in those roles. I mean, the audience says, well, I'm this guy, I'm that girl. Well, you know, when, when, I, when I grew up, you know, there was always the, the nerd, the misfit side character. <laughs> and and what, I, what I started to realize in real life is that everyone views themselves as a nerd or a weirdo or a side character. People <laughs> that I, I would like admire and think of, oh, they're supermodels. Yeah. But you would talk to them alone and they would say that they view themselves as, as misfits. And so I, I, one of the things that I'm always moved at is that, I'll do like a, a Comic-Con in New York and some girl will have traveled from Europe to come and, and say hi, simply to say, I felt like I was alone in the world until I watched your shows. And then I realized there's a whole community that thinks and feels the way I do. Yeah. And that's the, that is for me is, is the entire reason to be in entertainment is to connect people on a level that you couldn't reach on any other way. Those are wonderful rewards when somebody really says how, how much they appreciate your work and how they've, how, how you've touched them uh, and, and even did some life-changing moments. I, I mean, uh, I, I did an interview one time with Beth Riesgraf, who, who constantly says that women are approaching her about her role in leverage and saying, look, I feel that way. I was that misfit. And, and you brought that to the table. Well, I'll tell you a story, and this is a true story, is uh, I was recently making a movie, a science fiction movie in Serbia. And um, on a day off, I was in a very small little cafe in Serbia with the director and the, uh, the writer of the movie. And all of a sudden, this very nervous, red-haired, 20-year-old girl and her mother approached the table and in a thick Serbian accent asked me, are you Mr. Devlin? And I said, excuse me? And she said, are you Dean Devlin? And I'm thinking, I'm in Serbia. And someone's asking who I am. I said, yes, I am. Well, she got nervous. The mother got nervous. And she said, I'm so sorry to interrupt your dinner, but I just needed to come over and tell you that Leverage was a really important show for our family. And I was, I was kind of taken aback. And I said, you know, I've heard the show called a lot of things, but I've never heard it called important. I said, you know, why was it important? And she looked at me like I was crazy and said, oh, I, I guess you don't know what was going on in Serbia during the time that that show came out. She goes, but we here in Serbia felt powerless as people. We felt that, the, that governments and, and, and powerful people controlled everything and that we had no power. And she said, every week, my, my cousins would come over, my grandparents would come over, the neighborhood kids, we'd all gather around the TV. And for one hour a week, we felt that somebody would come in and defend us. That blew me away. That story just blew me away. She, she said it got them through the dark years in Serbia. I mean, it's remarkable. It is a very well-written show, but it's also giving it to the man is, is really, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, people feel helpless, and then they see this, and they go, well, you know, at least there's somebody out there, e e even fictionally, fighting for us. Well, you know, uh, uh, I tend to work in the realm of escapist entertainment, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, it's a much maligned area. It's, it's thought of as lightweight and, and not important and it doesn't win Oscars. But you know, occasionally we live through times like now yeah. where more than ever to get an hour to escape what we're all dealing with is really a blessing. You know, and, and I, I feel so lucky that we were able to finish and get the last episode of Almost Paradise shot literally 18 hours before the Philippines closed the airport. So we, we just got it finished. We raced to the airport. We got home and we got the entire season in the can. And I feel so lucky because not only did we love making this show, but I, I feel like it couldn't, it couldn't be more useful. 
than it is right now. To, to go to a beautiful place and have a fun adventure and just take your mind off of all the crap we're all dealing with. Yeah, and after this crap lifts, I, I, I think almost paradise will do a lot for the tourism in the Philippines as well because it is a it is, it is some of those places are still as pristine as, as the day God invented them. Uh, well, you know, uh, growing up a Filipino, you know, half Filipino, whenever I would talk to people about the Philippines, they only knew two things. They knew Amelda Marcus's shoes <laughs> and they knew Manny Pacquiao. And yeah, that was pretty much it. Yeah. And, you know, when I would tell people, well, did you know that some of the most beautiful resorts in the world are in the Philippines? They'd look at me shocked because the only times I've seen anything that has to do with the Philippines in movies is it tends to be poverty porn. Yeah. So, you know, to be able to highlight some of the beauty, some of the, the, the different aspects of society there that no one's ever seen. You know, this is the first television series in history that's been shot in the Philippines. So, you know, not just here in the United States, but all over the world, we're able to showcase remarkable talent that, that I mean, they're very famous in the Philippines, but outside of it, no one knew who these people were. And to get to showcase these, these producers, these, these, uh, the DP, the, the production designer, some of the, our directors, the actors, uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's so much fun for me because as a, as a film distributor, I've been aware of the talent level there, but because all of those films are done in Tagalog or, uh, uh, you know, a local thing, they, they don't travel these films. Uh, even when we were selling Almost Paradise around the world, there was great skepticism that the quality of the show would, would be up to snuff because they'd never seen things out of the Philippines. So, you know, I think when, you know, now that people are seeing it, it's, it's, it's made it quite an impression. I enjoyed the very first episode of, of Almost uh, Paradise. And I'll tell you, again, you've got the, you know, the kind of, you know, outsider, you know, tr trying to change his life and yet, Life happens. It is very, very funny, um, and yet has that real dramatic edge. It really reminds me of, you know, some of the other detective shows that were out of the seventies and and uh, absolutely. You know, it's it really is a lot of fun, and it looks like your cast is having a ball too. Well, you know, when we set out to do this, we we had a lot of talks about. It. We said, all right, well, look, we're going to do a show with ninety eight percent brown skinned people in a place that no one's ever seen before. Perhaps the show itself should be a very comfortable old shoe. And, you know, uh, uh, while the parallels to, to uh, uh, Hawaii Five-0 have been called out, it's really a lot more like Rockford Files, if you think about it. Yeah, it you is. Know, you know, it, it, I remember um, hearing um, uh, Gary Rosen, who, who, who developed the show with me, he had worked with Stephen J. Cannell. And he had told me that Cannell used to always describe Rockford as, as uh, Rockford is a character who for three acts trips over his own feet. And then by the end of it, figures out how to do it right. And we kind of took that as our, as our Bible for how to approach Almost Paradise. <laughs> it is frustrating sometimes to, to, to have a hero like this, and yet he comes through in such a really interesting way. You know, and your cast is just amazing. It just is oh. a riveting, fun show to watch. We got so lucky with this, t this cast that, you know, um, uh, uh, having worked with Christian on two other TV series, we've obviously developed an incredible rapport. And so what I, what I did is very early on, uh, I brought Christian with me to the Philippines and we did casting sessions in Manila. And what was so interesting about that is, you know, I've, I've done casting on every show I've ever done, but to have your lead actor there to, to get the chemistry, that's very rare to have. And literally uh, the, all the actors are in the show now, when they came into audition, as they walked off the stage, Christian turned to me and went, that's the one, that's the one. I went, calm down. We have more to people. That's the one. <laughs> And he was right. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was so clear, the, the, the magic and the chemistry. The distribution of the show, I mean, it's on WGN America, yeah. but are, are we going to be seeing it streaming sometime soon? Well, currently, uh, um, you can get the downloads on Amazon. Um, and uh, uh, my company, Electric Entertainment, we're selling it all around the world. We're right in the midst of closing a whole bunch of deals. Um, we are in talks with, with a couple different streaming platforms domestically here in the United States and in Canada and all mm -hmm. around the world. So, you know, each week as the show uh, uh, develops, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because, you know, uh, uh, when we signed up to do the show at WGN, they were going in one direction. And then midway through production, they shut down that entire division that we'd been dealing with. And mm -hmm. they, they, they really decided to move more towards a, a news network. So they didn't know what to do with our show. And they, they put us on at 10 o'clock at night on a Monday night without really any marketing or promotion behind it because it's not the direction 
that they're moving to as, as a network. And yet every week our numbers seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's, you know, that's not from marketing. That's not from great commercials. That's from people calling their friends and saying, you got to check this show out. And there's something really sweet about that kind of victory because it, it's, it's earned. It's earned off of what it is, not off of how it was hyped. Yeah, but I think you walk in with also a, a history, you know, of, of good television, of good works on TV. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm very proud of the work we've done. You know, uh, uh, you don't always hit a home run. You know, I mean, sometimes you make <laughs> stuff that's pretty embarrassing. I still get ribbed about Godzilla. Uh, but, yeah. but, you know, you never set out. You never try to make something that doesn't work. You know, and, and in, especially in television, we've been incredibly lucky, you know, between the librarian movies, the librarian TV series, oh, yeah. Leverage, uh, The Outpost. I mean, we, we've been so lucky that we, liter we haven't had a show that didn't work. And, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, as, as my, my, the Jewish half of my family would go, Ken Ahura, Ken Ahura. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to thank you, by the way, for putting people to work here in Utah uh, uh, on The Outpost as well. That's you know, uh, those are friends of mine. Elizabeth Berkner, we talked a little bit about her, you know, on Twitter and um, Adam Johnson. Those guys are just amazing. We have great, great talent out here in Utah. Well, you know, I, I did, a, I did a, 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 a pilot in Utah many years ago, and we shot uh, some of uh, Independence Day in Utah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, there's a new series that we're, that we're going out with this year that we're planning on. Uh, doing in Utah. So yeah, I've, I've always had a really good experience there. And if you're hiring fat, bald guys, then I'm... Well, you'll have to put on some weight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, Paul Weber is, is a dear friend of mine as well. And I talk to people all the time and no one has, uh, you know, a secret Dean Devlin story about, you know, <laughs> casting or acting. In fact, Katie told me that she, when she got to the set of Leverage, you were there and you greeted her personally and thank you for being part of that set. She almost cries when she talks about that. Well, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, they work for studios. Yeah. And if they, if, they're, if they have someone above them that treats them well, they tend to treat other people well. If they have people above them that don't treat them well, they don't tend to treat people well. But, um, you know, there is no studio involved in our work. And, you know, I think one of the things that makes me a little bit different than almost all the other producers is I write the check. You know, I, yeah. It, I, I'm, I've, got, I've got skin in the game like nobody else. <laughs> you know, if, if, if my shows don't work, my kids don't go to college. So, <laughs> so you know, I give it my all. I, I, never, I never put my name on something if I'm not truly involved. Before we say goodbye, uh, and, and thank you again for your time during this, uh, I know how valuable your time is. Oh, um, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about Stargate because that's, you know, everybody loves that show as well. Again, you've got a group of kind of misfits, you know, heading to different planets. Was that a battle to get it from the movies to television? Because I, re I, I understand that it was supposed to be a trilogy of films. So this is what's kind of interesting is that, you know, the, the movie was actually made independently. You know, I, I raised the financing through a company, um, that was, act that was actually a French company that had just opened up in, in Los Angeles. And I, and I got them to finance Stargate literally because every studio turned it down. Wow. I mean, you got to go back. This was, this was 93. Uh, and every, at that point, they said science fiction is dead. They said nobody cares about science fiction anymore. And so every studio had passed on it. I finally got the, this, this small independent company to pick it up. Um, but... Uh, but we had a bumpy road. We had a bumpy road before we had a really good finished film. And during that bumpy road, our financiers got scared and they sold the movie to MGM. And MGM hated the movie. <laughs> they only bought it because they could get it cheap and they, it gave them a movie to release in October and they had no October movies. Well, the movie went on to be the highest earning, movie, you know, highest October opening movie in history. It, it was a huge success. And they decided to turn it into a TV series. But they didn't involve Roland Emmerich or I in the TV series. Mm. They moved on without us. And, and uh, uh, the man, you know, there's a couple people involved in the TV series, but the guy who, in my opinion, was the crucial person was uh, Jonathan Glasner. Yeah. And so for years, he would avoid me because he knew how angry I was about the TV series. Not that I didn't think the TV series was good. I was just angry that someone took my child away from me, right? And I wasn't involved. 
Well, years later, uh, uh, you know, because Stargate, the TV series had been such a success, I had to take my hat off to the guys who made it because it had survived so long and it yeah. had it gotten so many fans. And even though it wasn't the direction that I was planning on taking the franchise, I was proud of it. And I was proud of those guys. So I called up Jonathan Glassner. I said, look, let's bury the hatchet. And we had a lunch. And at the end of the lunch, I said, you know, I got this show called The Outpost. Do you want to work on that with me? And then all of a sudden, here, here we are. And he and I now all have three seasons of a TV series together. <laughs> uh, you know, everything in Hollywood happens over lunch, which is why this quarantine <laughs> is terrible. <laughs> I know. It's hard to have a lunch meeting on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, lunch at the Four Seasons, and then, you know, you walk away with a headshot and a, and a contract. Yeah. Um, before I go, I mean, losing your babies, though, I mean, did that just happen again with leverage? I mean, I noticed an Asian... No, no, is... no, no. That's actually a lovely story. Uh, no, we, we own leverage 100%. Uh, trust me, after Stargate, I, <laughs> an independent <laughs> fan, I was never giving anything away again. You're actually uh, reading the contracts now. So, uh, yeah, no, what happened on leverage is we got approached by a South Korean television company, and they said, could we buy the remake rights for South Korea? And we said, Sure. And they said, well, you know, in South Korea, TV series only go one season. So it'll just be, you know, one and done. It'll be fun. I said, great. So we licensed it to them. They did it. It was a huge success. Uh, we loved what they did with the show. And um, they're actually going to do a second season, which is remarkable because that never happens. <laughs> it's like I said, I mean, this it, it's a great legacy that you have left this planet with with the entertainment, you know, and all of that. But, you know, again, I get verklempt talking to you because, uh, you know, and everybody says you're, you're a pussycat. Don't worry. But uh, I, I have to watch my P's and Q's always. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty easy going. I mean, it, it's rare I lose my temper on set. Not that I, and that's what I've heard, too. I said, you, you know, because we want the dirt on people, but there is no dirt on Dean Devlin. <laughs> well, I don't know. If you dig, dig a little harder, you know. <laughs> you never know. Nah. No, I don't need to. So I uh, did you enjoy your skiing trip out here in Utah during Sunday? I think you were out here during Sundance, weren't you? Yeah, we try to go every year. You know, we, we uh, uh, part of our company is we're a distribution company. We do both foreign and domestic distribution. And we've had wonderful luck picking up terrific pictures at Sundance. Uh, uh, so we go every year to see, you know, what's available to us. And then also, you know, often we'll make relationships with filmmakers. You know, I, I, I originally met Brian Singer in, in, at Sundance uh, 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 right around the time of Stargate. And, and you know, that, that later led to us doing that miniseries, The Triangle, together. That's right. So, That's yeah, right. No, Sundance is a, is, a, is a magical place. And, and to me, any excuse to get to go skiing is, is worth it. <laughs> Dean, I, again, I appreciate your time. And uh, uh, I could talk with you for another three or four hours. And... <laughs> Uh, I'll and we'll take bore the hell out of everybody. <laughs> Let's go to lunch sometime. And uh, it's next time I'm in Utah, we'll do it. All right. Uh, and thank you again for the time. And, and uh, my gosh, all the success in the world for uh, Almost Paradise on WGN America and, and other places. And Stargate movie, any, uh, anything you tell me? There may be one, but I wouldn't be involved. Ah, well, there you go. A leverage movie. You never know. <laughs> you never you never know what might come from Electric Entertainment. It's a great it's a great company and congratulations on Electric as well. Uh, a and, terrific uh, terrific company. And this is a little shameless plug right here. A little little shameless plug. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you know, I, I got I got this over here too. So I love it. All right, talk to you later, Dean, and thank you so much for your time, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks for having me.